Hey, how's it going everyone? In this video, I'm going to show you, not just tell you, what inodes are in Linux and how they work. As a result, you're gonna get just a better idea of how Linux works under the covers. You'll also get a quick kind of overview of what can commonly cause inode related errors that can be a little bit weird to track down the first time you see them. I have seen them in real big old production systems several times and just knowing the theory behind inodes and what Linux is doing uh, when it comes to files has really helped me debug, troubleshoot and fix those things or prevent them in the first place. I'm gonna show you how all of this stuff works, what makes up an inode and uh, what really happens when you uh, do a long listing on a directory. So without further ado, let us jump into the matrix. On Linux, files are very simple structures that contain no metadata, that is, no information about themselves. A file is really just a file name and an inode number. You're probably used to listing files like this, um, you know, like a list L or even just a list. Um, but what actually happens when you issue this long listing command? So a simple list truly just seems to look up file names, but where does all this other information come from on a long listing? You can think of a directory in Linux as something that contains a table of these file name inode pairings. And you can actually see that for yourself by doing ls-i for inodes. And you can see that these are pairs. So there's bundle scraper, and that, that has an inode number of 275.304 and so on for the rest of the files in here. So this is basically all that directories in Linux uh, sort of contain, uh, at least when it comes to this. You can think of a directory with a bunch of files in it, like this bundle scraper directory I'm in, as really just a table of file names and the inodes that they're associated with. What is in each inode? Uh, it's all of the information you see there. We're gonna actually look at one in a second, uh, but it contains the size of the file, invites, the location on the disk, so the actual like location on disk that Linux needs to read to get the file content, contains the permissions that you see up here, owner and group owners, and then things like file creation, uh, modification, access time, depending on which of those things is, is active. And it also contains the reference count, which you don't see here, which is basically how many hard links lead to this file. So how many places on the file system is it referenced? So when you're actually issuing this long list command, what's happening is Linux does that LSI. Well, it's not really running LSI, but it's, it's looking at the information that we saw as the output of LSI. And then it goes, oh, cool. Well, I need more information because I want to also list all this extra stuff. So I'm gonna look up this inode number. So it gets the equivalent of, of saying stat bundlescraper.py. Stat is a syscall, a system call, which is basically like what processes, normal processes do to, to ask the kernel to do something that only the kernel can do, like read from a device, like a disk, that kind of thing. So stat says, hey, please go and look up this inode and then the Linux kernel goes and looks up the information from that from that inode and then returns it back to our shell process here and then uh, it gets printed out here. And you can see all the stuff that I just described is in here. The file size in bytes, the actual device ID that it's on, the permissions for it, the group and user uh, ownership, and then access and modification times. I think it has a hard, here it is, links one. So this is a file that there are no additional hard links to this. It's just the single entry in this directory pointing to this inode. So you can see that this is just running in a loop basically for each file in this directory when you do a long listing. So for each file, it goes and stats the file, looks up the meta information from the inode, prints it out, modifies it, for example, if you're using dash H for human readable, well then it'll convert the, the bytes to uh, something that you can read, you know, if it's a few gigabytes, and there you have it. How does this actually practically come into play? Well, you might occasionally need to see the how many inodes uh, remain on your file system. This is really useful. Um, it has happened several times to me in real life that I'm getting disk write errors or errors that the disk is full or there's no more space on my device. 
but a simple DFH shows that I have plenty of space left, for example. Well, one thing that can cause that is inode exhaustion. I might see that when I run DFI or HI for human readable, I might see that I'm actually using 100% of my inodes on a disk or on a device. Um, and so even when there's space for data, it doesn't matter. I can't create new files because the inode tables are full. Like I can't create a new file because each new file requires an inode entry. This can happen on a file system where you have a ton of really small files like cache files or I don't know, <laughs> your machine's been hacked and uh, someone's hosting an entire porn site on, on your web server. Real stuff, real talk, it happens. When you get these kind of file system mysteries, like the disk has plenty of space left for data, but you can't write to it. Inodes are often uh, the culprit. And that's something that like, if you don't know about inodes or how files on Linux work, you just, you don't know where to start troubleshooting that. Let's talk a little bit about how inodes are created. Um, on most popular file systems, like if you're on EXT, the size of the inode tables on that you have available to you on the file system are determined when you create that file system. So usually that's part of like creating, uh, you know, installing the operating system and setting up your stuff for the first time. Unless you override those defaults, basically the, the size of the inode tables are usually tied to the size of the file system. So if you have a very small disk, especially on something like, you know, uh, the cloud, like if you're on AWS and you're trying to save money by not having too much storage space, you could run out of inodes pretty quickly if you have just a five or 10 gig system and then you try to dump a huge amount of small files onto that file system. File systems basically create the, all the space they're ever gonna have for inodes when the file system is created, unless you pass an extra flag during the file system creation uh, to override that. If, on the other hand, you're using a happy, lucky, wonderful, futuristic file system like ZFS, inodes are created on demand. So when you actually, it's not at file system creation time, it's on, at file creation time. So you create a file, an inode is created with that file, just like in Linux, but the actual space for that inode is not in some like fixed inode table. It's a data structure that can grow, I believe, in, in ZFS. Um, just another reason why ZFS is awesome. And uh, you, you should probably think about using it. Maybe I'll make a series about ZFS. Congratulations, you just learned what inodes are. You saw practically how they work, how they're used. This kind of stuff does come up in real life. The errors you saw come up in real life, preventing them or avoiding them altogether is a good strategy. And uh, it comes up in interview questions too. If I've done my job, I've done more than just teach you the theory and the practical stuff for inodes. If I've really done my job, you might be a little bit interested in ZFS now as an alternative file system for Linux. Uh, and that would make me very happy if I accomplished that goal. Some amazing stuff. I might make some videos on ZFS because I actually just got really excited about it. Cool. That's been useful. Like and subscribe. As always, follow me on uh, Instagram, TikTok. I uh, just post my dance videos there and uh, everywhere else. Uh, see you in the next one. Peace.